Wow, that took forever to get set up. I don't know. This might this might just be a practice run. I'm not sure. What happens is, and you've heard everybody complain about this with a live stream or even just a regular YouTuber, these OBS programs reset themselves sometimes. So it took me 45 boomer minutes to find my good camera. I won't even go through it, but it's just, it takes the wind out of your sails. Maybe I'll do it another day, but this was the perfect day, raining, I've been planning on it. And then I looked at my windows, maybe I wasn't planning so well, whatever. I'm going to try here and see what's up. Okay, today is uh, engineering around the physics. This was prompted and um, by a quote from Dr. Kevin Knuth at the Soul Foundation. Now, we've other people have said it before, but it really hit home this time because... I was thinking of doing a video on his presentation there or somewhere else. It's the same, roughly the same presentation about UAP characteristics and the energy it would take and et cetera and so forth. If you're one of the few watching this small channel, you probably know what I'm talking about. I assume you do. There's 20 some other videos ahead of this if you want to catch up to the story, but this is an ongoing soap opera about potential UFO or UAP propulsion. That's what I'm interested in. I have my own theory on it. It's all over those web channels and Twitter and wherever else I am, which is nowhere else now that you mention it. So uh, a rumble, of course, which is the same as this YouTube. So where am I here? I, this is my first, no, it isn't my first time. Uh, what we're going to do here is, yeah, okay, now we're looking at the, the thumbnail to get started and warmed up a little bit because, man, I'm cranky after that, I admit it. So, engineering around the physics. Oh, look at these guys demonstrating the principle that appears to defy physics. It was a big deal way back when. That might be the fifth of fourth, first Fourth of Fifth Bridge, whatever it's called. It's in Scotland. Anyway, those words don't even mean fourth and fifth. They mean the fifth over the fourth or the fourth over... It means something else in the local lingo. Anyway, so here we start with our thumbnail, you know. We make it X-ray to look spacey or whatever. And we're going to talk about these people. There's me. I'm going to talk a little bit about... Dr. Kevin Knuth and his presentation and some other physicists that are helpful and unhelpful in life. But it's our job as engineers. Uh, and when I started this, I thought, well, how do I criticize Knuth? I don't not, I'm not criticizing him. How do I do it with sounding nice um, about it? But his job, it, it, it's not a criticism. In other words, there are criticisms in here, but he's laying out a challenge that engineers have failed to meet. Now they've been bogged down by certain physicists and helped by others, and we'll get into that a little bit. And, um, and uh, well, that's the overview. So here we have Lord Kelvin said everything's been discovered. You have to do it my way or the highway give up all hope, etc., and, and so forth, uh, you know, it, it, he said that around 19, early 1900s, whatever, I think it was before the aeroplane was engineered by some guys that didn't have PhDs or physics backgrounds, we'll be getting into that a little bit, why that is not only unnecessary to conquer gravity, but it could be, in fact, a hindrance for example, this Kelvin type throwing uh, shade out there. But that's all right. He's forgiven because he did a lot of other great things. He just had a rough uh, day, I guess. And then we're going to look at this little known physics uh, guy over here who should be all over propulsion, alt propulsion, UFO, Twitter, whatever you want to call it, whatever this is. And his name is Arthur Ashkin. 
and he's also a PhD physicist, and he's a Nobel laureate. Okay, so he's as high up there as it gets. Some other people try to say this is the ultimate, whatever. Well, he's even more ultimate than them. And his uh, specialty is the light matter interaction, and you can look him up. Uh, A S H K I N Arthur. We'll get into him a little bit, but this is not a speech about him. Uh, but he's an inspiration to me personally. When I start looking into this, I start following him and his protégés, uh, whatever you want to call it, his line of physics, which then gets into the engineering world, optomechanics, basically, and uh, which is you know, 20 years old or whatever, a new, uh, roughly, you know, pretty new discipline, which holds the key to this stuff, uh, in my opinion. And then, uh, oops, went backwards. Then we'll be discussing other less helpful physicists that blow hard across this uh, topic. Um... Everyone's free to change the channel, of course. But don't go around saying you're the only one that knows anything. And then your only solution, after hours and hours and weeks and days and years of blowharding, is that somehow you're going to pretend to change a fundamental constant. All right? Some of you can guess who that is, but I'm not going to drop any names at this point. So we've started, uh, we've started the thumbnail, which gives us the overview. So now it's time for our opening benediction. From my uh, contacts and so on, uh, I, I think although there will be enough information coming out to finally lay to rest that this is not a tinfoil hat subject, and there's a reality to it. And uh, <clears throat> the government is making a concerted effort to, to uh, learn more about it. Um, <clears throat> I think any truly deep state increase knowledge is likely not to come out. I don't see all the barriers falling. Understand. Amen. My, uh, all right. In light of that, let's get started, I guess. Now, this is going to be a little choppy, I think, because I'm going to be playing fair using. Uh, yeah, let me get that over with. Yeah, this is a fair use. We're going to look at three YouTube channels, take uh, excerpts from them. And we are promoting them, and we like them, and we link them below, and all that good stuff. But first, we must go through the ritual. Well, we should. Where is... Where, I can't believe it. This has been quite a day of just stupidity on my part. Now, I lost a very simple thing. It's so easy to find. I use it every time. Here it is. It's just our little thing for YouTube and the law and as a retired lawyer, it's rather tiresome, but necessary. Uh, this is called Fair Use. This is allowed for the purposes of criticism, news reporting, teaching, and parody, which I guess we'll have some of all of that here, uh, which doesn't infringe copyrights. So we are not infringing any copyrights, and we'll go to the mat on that. But I don't think we, no one's gonna, there's no music in this or Disney or anything like that. It's all just science and engineering. But it's good to be on the safe side. So we're going to start, I guess. Let's look at the script. Uh, we went through Kevin Knuth inspiring this. Yeah, it starts out with. His quote. So let's let's hear it straight from him. Uh, I believe it should be right up front. If not, so what? We'll listen a little bit to some intro stuff. I'm, I'm skeptical. 
Whoops. You've all heard this a million times at this point. And we all know that this is code for, I'm not going to believe a word of what you're going to tell me in the next 10 minutes, and I'm not going to stick around very long. <laughs> and, and, <clears throat> and, and when scientists say this, it, it it's kind of bothers me because you're a scientist. You ought to be skeptical. You shouldn't need to be telling me this. I, I too, am skeptical. I'm a scientist. I'm skeptical. Of, I am skeptical of people who assume that when they see something strange that it's an alien spacecraft. Yes, I'm very skeptical of that. I'm also skeptical of scientists who assume that an anomalous observation has to be an error because they know their physics and there can't be anything that strange out there. I'm also skeptical of that. And this conversation usually proceeds to you know, something like that. Oh, the UFO was anomalous. No, it's not possible. We know our physics. Um, wave their cell phone around and, and, um, and this has come up many, many times. And it's rather surprising to me that these scientists believe that we know our physics when it is widely admitted that we don't know physics. We don't have a quantum. All right, he's got to say a little perfunctory introductory stuff there. And he's going to go into what you expect. The physics of UAP, that's the name of this thing. Quantum theory of gravity. We don't, and we know that quantum mechanics makes a difference. Quantum mechanics makes a difference with Maxwell's equations and electromagnetism. That's what makes this thing work. Um, one, you would assume that quantum mechanics will probably make a difference with gravity as well. And you might- Yeah, well, I personally believe in the graviton. Spin two does inertia and gravity. You know, what's gravity sideways? If I'm pointing to my right over here, um, you know, is Jupiter right over there, 90 degrees beside me? Wouldn't that be, you know, acting as gravity? How does that interact with the inertia that's supposed to be here? Because it's the same damn thing, pardon me, in a spin, uh, spin to graviton. Yeah, 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 yeah. Check my last video uh, for, for some deeper discussion of that, but that's it. And even so, what I, my, you know, overall viewpoint of using light in a gravitational field to mitigate gravity, that doesn't change if it's, no matter if there is no graviton, if it's just a wave or something, which it isn't. It's a wave of gravitons. A wave needs to be going through something. What does it go through? A spin to graviton, probably. I am not a physicist. I was an engineer for a while. You can look all that up on my profile and all that stuff. Um... So that's just my opinion, but it doesn't matter because what I'm saying, you can see with your own two eyes. I'd be able to do some spectacular things with that. But then again, waving the cell phone around, we know our physics. Um, the cell phone is not physics. I don't know if most scientists know this yet or not. It's not physics. It's engineering. It's a triumph of engineering. And engineering... Boom. And, you know, <clears throat> I'm not sure if, about all the quantum physics, uh, you know, how does that, is that, uh, is the graviton, you know, uh, is it going to be consistent with the quantum physics we have now? Uh, I don't, you know, you have to define what you mean for every one of these words. He does, I do, whatever, you know, it's, it's a bit convoluted, but... Here's where he gets into the triumph of engineering. And uh, you know what? It beats talking about Einstein's equation from a, over 100 years ago and clinging to that as, as, if, as if that's the only solution. Because it isn't. Is the act of using physics to find workarounds to problems. And that's what we're going to do. The physics... We're not going to invent any new physics. Um, we're going to rely on, on what already exists. And like I said, there's a whole thread following Ashkin. And um, the threads aren't tied together around engineering to solve this problem. That's the problem. That's why you see a UAP or UFO and don't know what it is. You see them. I, mean, I never saw anything. But, you, you know, I believe uh, uh, the testimony, let's say. Anyway, and even if not, what I'm saying will work for us.
Unfamiliar engineering can look a whole lot like anomalous physics. So I am not ready to immediately jump to the conclusion that there's anomalous physics going on when we see some anomalies. You are correct, sir. Anomalies. I'm more inclined to think that there's clearly some clever engineering, at least. Let's start there. Yes. <clears throat> so, what are UAP? Um, this is a horribly misused phrase. It's unidentified as ambiguous phenomenons, ambiguous. It's used to suggest that we do not at all know what these things are. Some of these things are observed very well and described very well. Um, it can't just be anything because it's unidentified. Um, that's unreasonable. Yes. And it's complicated because UAP are a class of phenomena. They're not a single thing. And um, <clears throat> the taxa are unknown at this point. We don't know what kind of unknown things are out there. Very sciencey word, taxa. Multiple hypotheses are likely to be found correct. Hmm. There. And we should expect there to be a lot of confusion when we really start digging in and studying this. There's going to be a conflation of hypotheses. Uh, yes, but most of them will be my way, in my opinion. Pumping light. Um, we're going to confuse one type of thing with another. Just like people who are unfamiliar with birds might, might confuse a hummingbird with a, with a hawk moth which looks very similar. Yeah, and both of those, look into it. Photonic crystals built right into their, their wings or their quote unquote feathers. Now they don't float 100% for that reason, but that helps. And it also keeps the air off reducing drag, okay? It helps a little bit. But uh, again, I'm a hawk moth, I, you know, I can't... Actually, he's a bird expert, um, which is interesting. He ought to look into those photonic crystals and some of those birds and those feathers. And why are they so hydrophobic? And isn't that what you want in a UAP? Hydrophobic, aerophobic. It, it reduces drag friction and inertial mass no matter how ancient the equations you cling to are. And they're very different things. So I have a recommended strategy that to reduce probability of error, we need multiple independent disparate pieces of evidence. We'll model this after multi-messenger astronomy with many different instruments, many imaging modalities, multiple He's an astronomer in astronomical earth, uh, physics. All right, so he doesn't need to be held to the physics of anti-gravity, if you know what I'm saying. Um, out of the goodness of his heart, he's, he's involved in this issue. It's not directly on point to his discipline. So, in other words, he's, he's helping here. He's going out of his way when... I guess what I'm suggesting is other phys physicists <clears throat> who are more directly associated or directly involved in, say, optomechanics, I guess, or whatnot, or um, whatever links up to aerospace engineering, which is still stuck in the past. Is there such a thing as an aerospace physicist anymore? Probably not, because the Newtonian... Well, I shouldn't say that. But the Newtonian stuff's been around. It works. It's been figured out. How many times are you going to reinvent that wheel? Uh, so that's where I think a gap appeared in techno technological development, which makes sense to me can't blame anybody for it it's not an it's not an organized like this video it is not an organized um, um, system of activity 
it's ran it's, it's not random but it's a bunch of organized things going up different silos and following different threads and sometimes there's no overarching eyeball looking at it which I find myself in the position of being that as a retired goofball out in left field seeing that well why aren't why isn't it more developed that's why because nobody's nobody overviews it that's another thing we're going to talk about toward the end uh, another sort of a discipline that's missing uh, well, we got off on that multiple observation points and multiple independent observing groups we've already seen examples of this from the talks by Avi and Beatrix and we need to divide and conquer the extraordinary hypotheses. You can handle this by focusing on less controversial aspects of one of these hypotheses and drilling down and slowly, slowly getting to that point. And then we need to remain agnostic with respect to the hypotheses, keep them on the table, and let's focus on characteristics. What characteristics are we observing? Um, what is the phenomenology, especially those characteristics that have implications, relevant implications for particular hypotheses, so that's helpful. So I'm going to talk a, a good bit about today, about mostly about characteristics of UAPs related to physics. <clears throat> good. Whoops. We have the, from the ATIP program, we have the five observables, five plus one really, um, positive lift, sudden and instantaneous acceleration, hypersonic velocity without signatures, transmedium travel, low observability or cloaking, and biological. All right, now I have a web page on that, and I've discussed all these before in detail on this channel. Uh, you can find that with a little bit of looking around. Perhaps I'll remember to link that page directly below this. Yeah, I will. I'll remember that because I'll have to uh, test the, I mean, uh, listen to it to make sure nothing went wrong before I upload it. Uh, but may as well do them briefly. One, positive lift. Yeah, light pumping. Two, sudden and instantation, instantaneous acceleration. Light pumping. You, to be, oh man. If you want to move like light, be like light. How do you do that? You use light. You start pulling it through yourself. When you don't weigh anything and you're controlling the gravitational field around you, by mitigating it, by spewing light out there. Yes, we went over that last time, and we're going to have to focus more and more and more on and more on that because it's coming up um, in uh, lab tests and things and experiments. And it's uh, you know it's it's intuitive, but you can't, it doesn't hurt to go over in as much detail as possible. But yes. It's going to look instantaneous if you suddenly don't weigh anything. You have zero friction and uh, inertia affecting you. You're going to take off, as I've said again. I hope I'm not repeating myself, but I have to. If the Earth is going 67,000 miles an hour plus 1,000 plus whatever the sun is doing, what I, you know, you're going to suddenly, that's going to be you. You're going to be fixed, and the Earth is just a thing moving by. And you can free yourself from gravity with mass. That's what these people should be. These physicists, not him, that's not his specialty. But these physicists and mathematical physicists and whatever they call themselves, I don't know. If you want to make progress in this area, do what I said. I'm not the expert you are, but I'm right on the big picture. Hypersonic velocity without signatures. Uh, yeah, it's using ambient light. Ambient light comes in, through, out, and around, come, goes right back out the way it comes in. Nothing, you didn't change anything, in other words. That's like when, you know, if you're pumping through the water, it's the same damn water that comes out the back. That's what this, that's all this is, most of it. So, yeah, the signature is going to look like what's already there, except it might be a little bit slightly infrared or, or slightly colder. Slight keyword there, slightly. And as soon as the light comes in, it's used and put right back out, peacefully and quietly. It's not stored and exploded 
or used to access or anything else. And yes, it will allow transmedium travel, number four. Uh, to what, you know, as long as you're not going through solids, okay? That's beyond me. That's the warp drive stuff. We are supposedly ripping apart the very fabric of space and time, Mr. Spock, with the massive forces or imaginary resonances that nobody will give you a number for. Yeah, okay? I'm a little skeptical on that stuff, okay? That works on paper. That's physicist stuff. This isn't how we engineer our way around it. Nothing wrong with that stuff, but I don't see it being practical in the near term. But the transmedium travel, yeah, light, space, air, atmospheres, anything that's got light moving through it quickly. Okay, When you get into solids, light isn't moving through it quickly. Heat might be moving through some of it, and it's all bonded together, and it, I just don't see that. Okay. Five, uh, low observability or cloaking. Well, yeah, yes and yes. But again, that has to do with the light pumping. Of course, it's if it's blending in with the background because it's using the background to go through the background, it's going to have low observability. And it's going to appear cloaked at times. It's easy to do that. You know, just Google, uh, search on uh, YouTube or Rumble and you'll find a hundred videos of invisibility cloaks. I retweeted one this morning. Some guy made a homemade shield and stood out of standing in front of his pickup truck hiding himself you know it's um it's time to stop pretending and uh, you know not seeing that uh, that is that is obviously obviously a similar phenomena or piece of the phenomenon well, that word gets overused Anyway, biological effects, not my department. But of course, yeah, I mean, could get radiation, burns, whatever. If, if you're not using the ambient light and you're pulling in nice, peaceful, cold light of the atmosphere, but spewing out laser, you know, uh, gammas or whatnot, yeah, it's, that could be dangerous. Don't, I'm surprised people don't go blind from it constantly. But that just shows you how efficiently, first off, how much little, how little needs to be done, but and how efficiently it can be done. Uh, that's but you have to copy nature, and uh, you know use energy density over time, as I have repeatedly harped on, and we'll catch on. All right. I forgot the five observables was in there, so that was a nice little rant, maybe. ...effects. And I'm going to start out by talking about pretty much the first three, all in one shot. Sorry, folks. And Gary mentioned the, the first paper that I wrote on this, I was interested in, in looking at some of these new cases, especially the Nimitz encounter. And I found it fascinating that, um, my graphics isn't quite working here. Um, <clears throat> I found it fascinating that these things were, uh, these tic-tac shaped objects were observed to drop from about 28,000 feet to sea level in 0.78 seconds. That is crazy uh, and, and really anomalous. How anomalous? Um... Yes, it is. It's crazy and anomalous to us in our Newtonian world of force and thrust and assuming that we're going to be subject to the gravitational field wherever we go, because we are right now, but it doesn't have to stay that way. That's what I'm, that, here's a takeaway. You can engineer your way around it with existing physics by using the properties of light to free mass from gravity. There's no debate about how a balloon works. All we are doing is optimizing that.
All I am suggesting, and I'm sorry about that ad. One of these days, I'm going to pay the $14. I think that's what it is, $14 a month to get rid of it. Do the math. Do the calculations. This is actually, um, I've criticized other physicists who've said, well, the analysis was rather simple. And, I, and I, my response to this was like, yes, you should have done it. You're st right. That's why this guy... Is, is, I was going to say, well, an overused, overused uh, superlative. But um, yes, he's right. He's on the right track with his stuff. Students could have done it. And in fact, there was a class in Georgia, a high school class. But that's where we're at with this stuff. Because everyone's still stuck on the old physics. Not the physics that already exists that isn't being used. And you could say, well... Well, I could say. I could blame the engineers for it because they didn't see it. Not so much the physicists. Physicists aren't necessarily out there to solve problems. They're out there to make observations and things like that. Um, there's a fine line called applied physics, which I thought was, I, I will revisit in the end. Um, and, and this society... Uh, does not really have a function where um, someone just sits and looks at physics papers all day and and uh, says, well, what could this be used for? And, and uh, I've complained many times. A lot of these scientific papers, well, most of them don't have a purpose. They don't have a conclusion. They don't have a reason in the paper for what what the hell they're doing it for. You know, if, only 16 people in the world understand the, why they're doing it, and that's their competitors over at Laboratory B instead of Laboratory L, whatever. Ugh. Anyway. So, he's right. In Georgia, high school physics class that used this paper as an example on how you can um, do um, and make estimates of kinematics. Uh, so, if you if you um, look at this, you can estimate the minimum acceleration, which comes about from the object would have accelerated halfway and then decelerated the other half of the way. That gives you a, a lower bound for the acceleration, which comes out to be around 5,000 Gs. Well, it's not feeling the Gs because it's controlling the G field. Um, by the shape of the light bubble it's in. But it's interesting the way he says it's, you know, it has to slow down, in other words, in the Newtonian mindset, which is not inconsistent with thinking in terms of freeing yourself from gravity. It's, uh, it's uh, it, you know, there, you can compare them and map the idea of it, and you can look at it as thrust coming back out this way, like the, like Elon Musk's rocket landing this way instead of going blasting off this way, okay? What's it doing? It's still, quote-unquote, thrusting, <clears throat> but for a different purpose, right? Same, isn't it? It's counterintuitive until you start thinking about it too much. 5,000 times the acceleration of gravity. Um, no, people aren't going to survive this. Most. Yeah, but if you're shutting the gravity off around you, basically, first off, you're weightless in all directions. Inertia, you know, I'm, I'm almost tired of having that mental discussion with myself. It's the same force every which way you go, all right? Probably from the graviton, which is affected by light and is, of course, affected by mass, and it affects light, and, it, of course, it affects mass, all right? Simple stuff that even I can remember. Takes a while to figure it out, though. But we know that light mitigates it. It, 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 it. it will scramble it, for lack of a better um, word. As we saw in those experiments 
in my last video with Wayne, and it's called Light and Gravity something. I don't think I'm going to click through it right now. I don't, I don't need to disrupt the flow. And that, uh, you know, that again references a couple of published papers. And they're seeing this on other attempts at propulsion systems, some of which are <coughs> tested over at the APEC altpropulsion.com. And they get results that they can't understand, or they don't, they're getting positive results, but they can't explain exactly why. This is exactly why. If you're throwing radiation of some sort or changing it in some sort around you, and by that I mean light, the full spectrum, listeners to this channel know what I'm talking about. I'm going to take off these earphones because I'm yelling even louder. But that's all right. You can always turn it down, but sometimes you can't turn it up, right? Because it's too low. I'd rather have it too loud and turn it down than be too low for people's equipment. So, where was I? I forgot where I was. Oh, my. What a day. The equipment won't survive this. Um, an F-35's wings will rip off at about 13 Gs. So, 5,000 Gs is really anomalous. Um, and, you, and we estimated the power. And, of course, to do this, you need to know the mass. We don't know the mass. These things were estimated to be about the size of, a, of an F-18. And an F-18 is around 10,000 kilograms of mass. We... But it's losing mass equivalents quicker than the gravitational field requires to function. In other words, you're weightless. Literally, you're all the way to... Depending on how fast you want to go, are you completely weightless? Eh, no, just 27,000 miles an hour weightless for a moment. Then I'll be 60,000 miles an hour weightless, and then I'll make a left, and then I'll be 45,000 miles an hour weightless that way. Doesn't matter, I'm weightless. The, the more I move through me, the more I'm moving through the medium, which is not the air on your planet. It's space itself, which has your planet in it, true. So that's what they're doing and we could be doing, all right? So if there's no, you know, if, if your, your ship is scrambling the gravity around it, it's pushing away enough air, which may be only a few wavelengths, keep that in mind. Or it might be a nice, you know, Buffer, I, 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 that I don't know. I'm going to need calculators for that, and we're going to have AIs working on that around the clock, you know, for every scenario. But uh, once it's understood, it's done. It's like orbital mechanics, okay? That had to be pretty scary for a while. Um, so you're not feeling the G's. That's uh, You're not feeling the G's, and you're not moving. The planet's moving. You're staying still. You are losing mass. You are losing mass equivalents. You have no inertia bothering you either, which is the same damn thing. Plus, you're controlling the gravitational field around you. If you want to spew gravity disruption that way because you want to fall that way because you're close to a planet, then you'll do it. If you want to spew it that way because you're far from a planet and you want to catch up, you see, it's... Yeah, it does get, it gets, gets counterintuitive because you got to do the, you know, we're so used to thinking in terms of thrust that we don't think in terms of the gravitational field yet. All the waves going every which way. Very weak, of course, but, um, well, I'll get deeper into what I really want to say. I'm trying to find a clever, quick way to say something. I haven't done that yet because I'm still stuck on this one. Um, and I might have already said it, but I don't remember it right now. It decided, let's take a much lower bound, let's take one-tenth of that. So we just assuming that this was maybe one-tenth of the mass of an F-18, you come out to a power that you can't read under there easily of um, 1,100 gigawatts of power. 
This is more than 10 times the total nuclear power output of the United States. Now, I like these calculations um, a lot, um, but it doesn't take that much because you're not doing it through the Newtonian system and all that stuff. But if you wanted all that power for some reason, which if you were in a hurry, you might start using it, but you'd be gone out of the atmosphere, long gone. If you if you started using you started using that kind of Newtonian calculus the power you get from that if you started using it from a light pumping mindset you're gone man <laughs> uh, oh boy let that sink in for a minute one thousand gigawatts if you remember the movie Back to the Future when he's got to power up his car one point two gigawatts. I mean, that was 1.2 and he's all freaking out. This is a thousand. This is one craft. One craft the size of an F-18. How does... Let's see, you can, pull, you can pull that right out of the air. Because that's what... Here, here's where... All right. A lot of people have seen these calculations on how much sun hits the planet. And if we could only conquer that... Solar power would have, be able to plant, you know, you could plant, you could power the whole planet with a one acre or something, you know, that sort of thing. Well, that stuff's right. So, but we can also use it for this purpose. That energy density of the ambient light, which a lot of it's coming from the sun right now since it's daytime. But it's also in space. It's just space itself is also light because it's cold temperature. So if you're far, far, far from the sun, you still have plenty of light. It's just we conflate the word light so much with what we get from the sun, visible light, what we use. Anyway, let's go on. Does this happen? We don't know. This is where the anomaly is. This has been known for a long time. Um, Hermann Oberth was the German father of modern rocketry. He was a mentor of Werner von Braun. Um, there's Hermann in the front center, the very grumpy gentleman there. Um, why is he so grumpy? He's grumpy because in 1954, he gave a lecture on flying saucers where he pointed out that they have been measured to travel at speeds of 19 kilometers a second, which is about 42,000 miles an hour. And he points out that, he actually says, if there would only be three or four measurements, I would not rely upon them and would wait for a few further measurements. But there's existing more than 50. Again, that's sitting in neutral. That's riding the clutch, we used to call that, for anyone that ever drove a stick. Such measurements, radar measurements, in 1954. That's like 70 years ago. This was known 70 years ago that these things are flying at spacecraft speeds. Why do people always assume they're spacecraft? It's simple, because they fly as fast as spacecraft do. This doesn't take a PhD to figure this out. I like that logic, my friend. <clears throat> Yet yeah, PhDs can't handle it. Ooh, wish I said that. Um, here's another work done by um, French researcher Claude Poer, who looked at the radar observations at Mino Air Force Base in 1968. Um, really interesting encounter there where the object, a plane actually banked and flew over the UFO, which was egg-shaped and looked like molten lava. Um, the accelerations were measured to be 209 Gs with a top speed of about 9,000 miles an hour. And JAL Airlines across, flew across Anchorage, Alaska in 1986, followed by a, a large UFO um, that the pilot estimated to be three times the size of a 747. How wrong can you be with that estimate? Okay, let's say you're off by 20%, <laughs> which would be a pretty big error. Um, this thing's the size of an aircraft carrier. He said when it came in front of the plane, he couldn't see out of the windscreen. Um, you're not that wrong at this point. You can't just disbelieve the observers. Um, but there exists radar data. Um, when I summarized it, I just I, I analyzed the summary of the data. Um, Dr. Kumbi, who was at the Niels Bohr Institute, did a much better job. He actually recovered the radar data set, and he analyzed 11 jumps made by this aircraft-sized object, and found that three of those jumps, the aircraft, the, the, the craft, had accelerations of 9,000 Gs or more. Wow, he must have put it in second gear. A giant aircraft carrier sized walnut looking thing. Wow. But it's all it's only using the ambient light. It just knows that whoever designed it knew what they were doing. That's the difference. With a top speed of two hundred and sixty nine thousand miles an hour. Through the air, no sonic booms. Don't ask me how, but this is the anomaly. Um 
269 miles, 1,000 miles an hour, you can get to the moon in less than 50 minutes. Why do we think these things might be spacecraft? Because they move much faster than our spacecraft do. Um, this is, should be worrisome. <clears throat> These exhibit extreme accelerations. They've been tracked at hypersonic speeds in air many times. Um, we, they do not make... I love this little note on his slide. No sonic booms or fireballs. Yeah, that's right. Because it doesn't touch, directly touch the air. So why would it have a sonic boom or a fireball? I mean, it's so easy once you see it. You can't unsee it either. It's like headache. Oh. Off the bottom of the screen, they don't make sonic booms or fireballs, which you would expect, so something very strange is going on. And one thing that's almost never mentioned is there's no energy deposition when they stop. This thing drops from 28,000 feet to sea level, um, getting up to about 42,000 miles an hour in the middle, and then stops. Where did all that energy go? Well, goes right back where it came from two nanoseconds ago. I mean, it's... The concept is easy. But you have to visualize how fast that can happen. And then sort of visualize or imagine that it can be done in the physical world. But it can be done in the physical world. Um, that's not me saying it. Just follow me on Twitter if you want to see every day how uh, something comes out about in the field of optomechanics, just to put it, put it uh, short and sweet. You know, first you worry about where it came from, but where did it go? Um, energy doesn't just disappear. When this thing comes to a stop, there ought to have been... Green and clean an explosion and given the amount of power that it took you can estimate how big that would have been should have been an explosion about with about two, the same amount of energy as 250 um, tomahawk cruise missiles so yeah but that's if you're fighting your way through air and normal gravity instead of not fighting your way through air cooperating with it you're using the same light matter of fact that airs in your light and uh and the gravity you know what you do is you shut it off simultaneously blowing. That's what should have happened. It didn't. What's going on? We don't know. But these are, I treat these all as clues. These are clues to be used to figure out how these things work. Hi, I'm Sam Jordan, Director of Humanitarian Action for the International Rescue Committee, Conflict and Constraints. Now I mentioned that they're going spacecraft speeds. This is really remarkable. So here's on the left is a plot of a ship speed under constant acceleration. If you accelerate at 1000 Gs, you can get to this to 90% the speed of light in 17 hours. You can get up to 90% the speed of light in less than a day if you can maintain that acceleration in space. That's at 1,000 Gs. The Tic Tac case, we estimated to be about 5,000 Gs. Um, the JAL Airlines case was 10,000 Gs. At 10,000 Gs, you can, you can get up to 90% the speed of light much, much faster. Um, how far can you go this way? Well, once you're traveling close to the speed of light, relativity kicks in, and so for the traveler... You see that? This will do that. This light pumping concept will do that. You're going through space, which is light. You use the light to go through it by pulling it through the skins and bodies of a massive object. And yes, it can be done. It's, you know, it's just pulling it through. But you have to design the material to do it. And frankly, that material's already out there. It's not a pie-in-the-sky uh, magic material that's going to change universal gravitational constants or some such fantasy. It's going to use the ambient light and, uh, for its momentum and then put it right back. you can traverse great distances in short periods of time. For us, home bodies who stay at home, it'll take years and years and years for them to get somewhere, but not for the traveler. So the plot on the right shows you how far you could go and how fast. So at 2,000 Gs, you can get to Proxima Centauri in about three days, the nearest star. Um, you could, at 10,000 Gs, you can get to all of those stars within 50 light years um, in less than a day. You want it? You got it, pal. 
it's a day trip from a star 50 light years away to Earth for you. Uh, for the rest of us, it's 50 years. Well, that part, you know, you guys can find out uh, about that. Uh, I'll take the, sh the two day trip and see if uh, see if anything happens first. That other stuff, I don't know about that. It's possible. But then, why should I? It's not my job. And, and we know this from physics, because we know our physics. Um, yet the people who know their physics don't believe this is possible. There's a strange thing going on here in the minds of some people. <clears throat> not only do these objects have the flight characteristics necessary for interstellar travel, they would make excellent interstellar craft. Um, this isn't the only aspect that's interesting. Um, luminosity, their luminosity is always puzzling. No, it isn't. It's the cause of why they can travel like that. I mean that in a nice way. I realize I'm yelling a little bit here. Uh, I'm just, uh, I hate when people say I'm passionate about the subject, but I have strong opinions on it, yeah. So that's why they glow. That's the luminosity that is not puzzling. I, I would uh, suggest that it's not puzzling when you look at it my way. These things aren't landing in Central Park. I hate seeing the White House lawn. It's so nationalistic, as if that's a great place to land. Oh, but they don't land in Central Park, yet they're bright. They fly, they fly all over the place with these bright lights on. They're not trying to hide. And when you look at this luminosity, it's, it's a little, they're extremely luminous. Here's three photos of very luminous um, UFOs, and it's hard to interpret. I guess you can see why <laughs> um, maybe I'm wrong, but just humor me for a moment and assume I'm right about that. Can you see why I wouldn't be in the slightest bit surprised that a thing like that would be luminous? It's supposed to be luminous. That's why every bit of those lumens you're looking at it's mass equivalence that's gone. That's why it's weightless. But it happens quickly over time. We're talking about 10 to, 10 to the 1 with 15 zeros behind it. Times per second. Or maybe 18 zeros when you shift it into overdrive if you have the turbo model. But it doesn't have to be lighting up the whole sky it only takes what it needs maybe a little buffer and puts it right back that's why it's called propellantless so yeah they're going to be extremely luminous but again i want to thank these space aliens for not accidentally blinding everybody that could be a disaster but it, it just goes to show you, you don't need that much. Just a little light glow. Any, any of those could, you can see some, you know, they're visible light. Okay, that's why that we can see them. But that could be just heat coming out of there. And you couldn't see it. Because you can't see heat. It's like, yeah, but there's a thing there behind the heat. Yeah, it's behind the heat. Or it's within it. So you can't see it. That's why these uh, radars come up with objects that people can't see. They only see them on the radar. Sometimes you can see them, sometimes you can't. But if you can see them on the radars and the FLIRs and things like that, that makes sense. They may or may not be doing that on purpose, cloaking and hiding, but they're just using what's there. doesn't really matter which one you use. Perfect these pictures because they're so luminous. And the case on the left was analyzed by um, Dr. Bruce McAbee and then um, also um, summarized and reported by, by Jacques Vallée, Dr. Vallée. And if you, they were able to look at the, um, the, original, the original photograph and measure the exposure level. And if you do this, you find that the luminosities are on the order of 2,000 to 30,000 megawatts of light coming off of this craft. I like it. Who the heck needs a thousand megawatt lights? And what? Well, <laughs> I think you answered your own question. What would you use them for? Why would you? I think you answered your own question. You do this. 
it doesn't make any sense. I, I... It makes, but that part's wrong. It doesn't make any sense. I, I think he's being semi facetious or rhetorical, shall we say? But uh, he might know. I don't know. Some of these, no idea. What... I, I th it, it's kind of a thing that I think people know intuitively. That things like that are for a purpose. That's what he's getting at here, kind of. Especially when we consider that these are probably advanced beings. So why would you shine the light to, to announce yourself when you could easily ride in on heat and uh, not be seen? You know, you don't. For one thing, you don't care. But another, but also that's how it works. It's like saying, why does that car have wheels on it? Why would anyone put wheels on a car? Rhetorical, that is, you know. What the purpose of such a light would be. Um, if you perhaps couldn't help it, if you had a propulsion system that somehow gave off light like this as a... You can feel it when you go to work. When you go to church. When you pay your taxes. That's why. You have the gut feeling. Follow it. As a byproduct, that would give you a clue as to how their propulsion systems work, which is interesting. It's a big clue. It's the only clue. And that's what I'm interested in. But well, then you, good. You don't have to worry. What kind of people have propulsion systems that waste thousands of megawatts, and they don't really care about it? Um, well, it's not wasted. Um, it's not wasted. It's what's holding the thing up. That tells you something about the amounts of energy that they're willing and able to play with. Um, so maybe this is important. Yeah, but it's free. It's coming right out of the sky. You want free light? Walk outside. You got it. Information. Now, it's possible that the assumptions that went in here was that the object was radiating uniformly. Now, if you're putting out 30,000 megawatts of light in this picture, um, the amount of light hitting those clouds would be about one third of total daylight. And you don't see the clouds being illuminated. So it probably isn't um, shining uniformly. Right. Why would it? Because it's going that way. So it's shining more that way than this way. Or is it the other way around? Anyway, it gets counterintuitive. It depends on which way the earth is spinning. Where's, you know, what's the latest astrological sign? You know, it depends on a lot of things on exactly which way you're going to be shining that thing at the any given moment. The Earth's spinning this way, gravity's pulling that way, and Earth is going this way. But how high up? Are you past your Laplace point? No, your Lagrange point? I always get that mixed up. At some point, you're at that Lagrange point with respect to the Earth, or wherever, let's say the Earth. You're out there, you're just beyond orbit, uh, whatever that is. And you're just stuck. You're there in, in orbit. So you want to go down. So do you push that way and s diminish the gravity this way? Would you shine it that way? Uh, eh, probably, but... And then you fall down to where the gravity is. <laughs> no, I was going to say diminished. It will increase your mass this way. So you shine it down to go down, right? Again, it depends on at what point you're at. And I'll tell you, I don't, I don't have that. I can't see it right now completely perfect. Because especially when you've got the moon out there, you're spinning this way. You want to go that way or this way. Anyway, it's some combination. That's what I'm getting at. That's what I meant. That's what I forgot to say, I think, last time in my last video. It's some combination of weightlessness, inertial mass reduction, which is weightlessness sideways, which is pretty much the same thing, and then disturbing the gravity. So I guess it depends on where the gravity is that you want to disturb. Plus, when you're controlling your weightness, weightlessness, there's an element you can also call that thrust. It's got the same, it's the same thing, only looking at it differently. It's, it's, and again, for us earthbound earthlings that are used to thinking that way, 
it's hard to visualize. Sometimes it's easier, sometimes it isn't. I have to have complete silence and all that stuff and focus. And then I can do it a little bit. I can do it on, you know, scratch paper, but not while I'm yapping out loud. Uh, let's see. It could have been that it directed a light at the planes. And if it did that, you can revise the estimate and you get a much lower estimate of the power, which is about, comes up to close to two kilowatts. Still a lot of power for a light. And why it would shine a light at the airplanes flying by, it's, it, again, it's hard to interpret what's going on here. But it's extraordinary, certainly. So um, Dr. Vallee has, had, had summarized other luminous power estimates from tens of kilowatts to 500 megawatts. Um, <clears throat> thousands of megawatts of power itself is shocking. Um, these powers are again on the order of what you expect from a nuclear power plant and and they're similar to what we're seeing in the maneuvers it's more but yeah it's multiple uh, plants but again you don't need that much because you're also smashing up the gravity you're diminishing the gravity so yeah you need some luminosity but not as much as you would if you were subject to the gravitational field so you're detaching yourself if you're weightless one photon might ping you six miles in that direction. See what I'm saying? So you don't need that much. Um, but it looks like that much because your, his assumptions here and Valet's assumptions, they're using an assumption that this thing is attached to gravity or is subject to gravity instead of controlling gravity. And when you're controlling gravity and you don't want it, you get rid of it. And yeah, that takes 2,000 megawatts for a giant, whatchamacallit. 2,000? Is that what he said? Uh, yeah, that's quite a few, yeah. So, so there's some interesting information here. Now, there are also electric and magnetic effects. I had just started as an engineer working on the International Space Station. And I remember thinking, how are we ever going to do this? How are we going to assemble something that's over a football field in length? It takes 52 computers just to operate it. And then I sat down. Well, that's interesting, but that's, that's a two minute commercial. I was gonna play it, but it's, it goes on too long. Um, where was I? You might recall the scene from Close Encounters of the Third Kind where Richard Dreyfuss is in his truck investigating power. All right, I'm going to double speed this. We've been on one and a half speed because he, uh, he comes up with a nice theory that uh, takes us back to the days of V8s and spark plugs and carburetors and things, which is a nice review for someone of my uh, vintage. Oh, look, there's a little diagram there. Distributor cap, ooh. Wow, that takes you back, huh? Um, Richard Doofus is in his truck. <clears throat> Let's see, in the encounter. Yeah, so here he goes over the uh, why a UFO might stall out a truck by messing uh, with the electrical field. And it's a very elegant and clever and fun discussion to listen to. But I'm going to go through it at twice the speed and just punctuate it by saying, yeah, you know, there might, it might be an electric field. It might be a magnetic field. I think they have been measured at some of these places or sensed. But also, if you're throwing that much light out into the air, there's a little truck right there. You can see it on your screen, the truck from the, uh, the movie with Richard Dreyfuss. And his truck stalls and then starts back up when the flying saucer goes away. And yeah, it could be the electric magnetic fields doing this. Or it could be that light shining directly down onto the truck. It's changing the um, composition, the energy levels, the density, the whatever, the whatever of the air. So the oxygen that the cylinder needs to fire isn't there right now. Um... You know, so that little Schrodinger's cat moment that he says is from the spark, I think. Um, yeah, the magnetic field stops the spark. It's holding it there, basically, I think. 
which is cool to think about. But um, all the spark in the world, you're not going to burn anything if there's nothing to burn. And by burn, I mean explode the gas molecule using the oxygen in the air, which once again is all light. When we explode fuel, what is it? Releasing light. Anyway, let's go on with this. Power outages and the UFO flies over his truck and the truck stops running. Um, McCampbell in 1983 had identified several automobile interference types. You get an engine disruption and failure. The engines sometimes fail to restart in the vicinity of a UFO. And when the UFO leaves, sometimes the engine restarts. When I saw that in the movie, I was like, oh, this is just silly at this point. Engines don't just restart. <laughs> you can't just, how is the UFO magically restarting the engine? Um, <clears throat> well, if you think about the physics, you can reason through this. And this is what uh, McCampbell had done. If you have a strong enough electric field around this UFO, you could possibly be ionizing the air. How strong has this field got to be? It's got to be on the order of 3 times 10 to the 6 volts per meter. That'll short out the spark plugs in the car. It'll short out the distributor cam, so the car will stop running if it's a gasoline engine. If you That's fair. have a diesel engine, like the Ford 170 in this movie, it should not stop running. Sorry, Spielberg. <laughs> so his car should not have stopped. Now, what I find fascinating, basically, what we're doing here is kind of fun. We're using a vehicle as an electric field detector. Um, I don't have to calibrate it, so I can go back and look at reports. And, and you can rather sometimes trust reports, because people probably don't have much of a hard time telling whether their car died or not. So, all right, so if you are shorting out the spark plugs, the engine can't fire, so the engine stops running. Um, why would a car restart? Well, this is basically a circuit diagram of, of the um, circuitry in an old car, a pre-computerized car. You're shorting out the spark plug, it can't fire. You're also going to short out the distributor cam. So you I'm tempted to skip here. But I don't know where to skip to, and I don't want to annoy people with the skipping part. Skipping back and forth. Let's just listen to them. We've got current running through the primary of the ignition coil. So this ignition coil is a magnetic field. And the way the car works is it creates a magnetic field. It then turns off. That magnetic field collapses, induces a current, higher, a current in the secondary at a higher voltage, which goes to the spark plug and fires. Now, when the UFO is hovering over here, you've shorted out everything, so the spark plug can't fire, but you've got a large magnetic field sitting at the primary coil. Now the UFO leaves. The switches all stop shorting out. The current stops flowing. The magnetic field collapses, induces a current in the secondary, which sends a pulse to the spark plug. And if you work through how the stroke of the engine works, the 720 degree cycle stroke of, a, of an engine, you find that the power stroke takes 145 degrees out of that 70 degrees, 720 degree stroke, which is about 20% of the... Got that? The time the piston is in a power stroke state. And about half of that time, it has got fuel in there ready to fire. That pulse comes and hits the spark plug. 10% of the time, that piston will fire. The car restarts. And if you look at the data, you find that only 10% of the cars that are stopped by a UFO restart when it leaves. The numbers match. Um, in Rodiger's catalog, he has 268 cases in which the engine stops, and in 27 of those, it restarts when it leaves. And you can understand this once you understand how the system works. Physics. It's not magic. These things are not magically starting up a car. It's actually reasonable. It's actually reasonable. Now the problem, what makes this really anomalous, is the electric, field, electric fields on the order of 10 to the 6 volts per meter generated by a small UFO are going to require several coulombs of charge, which is a crazy amount of electric charge, and that's about 10 to the 9th joules of energy. Again, huge, huge, huge amounts of energy. Not so surprising anymore considering the luminosity as we've seen and the maneuvers. They also create huge magnetic fields, and the light in the sky is naturally polarized, and these huge magnetic fields can, create an, can cause an effect called the Faraday effect, which rotates the polarization of the light. So if you take a photograph of... Yeah, but so can... Uh manipulating chirality and polarization of the light, which I think they do, but I'll allow it. ...of a UFO with a polarizing filter, which I recommend for this reason, you will see um, that you'll get rings around the UFO if it has a large magnetic field. Um, this has been observed and has been photographed. This is a photograph that Meeson published in 2012, showing Faraday, what looked like Faraday rings around a UFO. Um, however, the magnetic fields generating this have got to be on the order of 10 to the 11th to 10 to the 13th um, amp meter squared. That's the, the magnetic field, the dipole moment of the magnetic field. Huge, 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 huge. Again, maybe not so surprising anymore since we've already talked about three. Yeah, but, you know, you can buy sunglasses to do it and undo it. I mean, these metamaterials... They will chiralize, they will depolarize, they will repolarize, they will chiralize, they will absorb and emit with luminosities and the atosecond, um, what's that for As many watts as you want. Giga, ziga, jiga, what? Zeta, pepta, all of them. Um, physics effects that are... And you don't need the big electric and magnetic field, I mean... You want it, you want it, but you don't need it. That's that's wasteful. You don't know what you're supposed to do, and somehow it all just comes together. And then you don't know why you wouldn't have known it in the first place. Click here now. The other strange thing that these things do is the transmedium travel, and there's an affinity for water. Um, <clears throat> 
So this is a, from Aquilia. You can see the UFO dips into the water. It doesn't make a splash. doesn't seem to affect the water very much. In fact, the analysis done by SCU... All right, let's slow her down a little bit for this stuff. Back down to 1.5 for the transmedium stuff. And the lower right shows that as the UFO hits the water at about 1,000 miles an hour, or 1,000, I'm sorry, 100 miles an hour, it continues traveling through the water at around the same speed. It only drops down to about 85 miles an hour. And it actually accelerates at some points. <clears throat> More remarkably, I talked to um, uh, veteran David Barnett from New Zealand. He was a sonar operator on the HMNS MZS New Zeal Southland in New Zealand in November of 1986. Um, this is when JAL Airlines happened, right? <laughs> I just realized this. Um, in February, so they're, they're, they're ex they were performing exercises there where they would leave out of Auckland, head out of the Hiroki Gulf into the Pacific Ocean, but, and, and then turn around and come back, in, and they were to turn on their sonars to see if they were being followed by unidentified submerged objects. And this, they were followed, they would do this several times a day for weeks, and many times they were followed back in, usually by one or two small USOs that did not have propeller wash, so they couldn't identify what they were. Um, Again, yeah, no propeller wash because, again, they're in a nice slippery light bubble. So go check my videos. You'll see videos, uh, you know, devoted only to USOs, which link to Twitter moments and events and things, and there's plenty of information there. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it, again... It's the same principle being used. All this is is a different, thicker fluid. To them, that's just another part of the atmosphere. If you're coming in there, you know, yeah, we breathe air. This part of the atmosphere is where the shaved ape lives. But that's just part of the atmosphere. It's thicker. It's a, it's going to be a, a humid down there today. Yeah, so... And, and as they got back into the Gulf, the USOs would usually take off. Um, in one occasion in February, they were followed by a large USO which beamed about 150 feet wide. And when they finally made a sharp 45, a sharp turn where they had to bank at about 45 degrees um, at 20 some knots, um, they were able to get a view from it from the side. And it was 800 feet long. Um, it's about 30% longer than a Typhoon class submarine. This is a big craft. And it was following them. And it did not break away once they got to the Ruki Gulf. So they maintained top speed. They, they made some more turns to try to shake it. And when they did this, the 800 foot USO closed the distance of 20 kilometers. It was 20 kilometers behind them. It closed that distance in about 30 seconds, went under their ship, and took all, killed all the power. The ship lost power. The batteries drained. Um, they were basically adrift. Whoops and couldn't call for help. And they had to wait for four hours before they could wave down a fishing boat to be able to call for help and be rescued. Um, you can estimate the minimum speed of the USO underwater. The minimum speed is around 1,500 miles an hour. Whoa. That would assume that you would immediately accelerate to 1,500 miles an hour and then cruise under the ship. Um, the minimum acceleration, though, would be one where you accelerate at a minimum rate of 4.5 Gs underwater, but reaching a top speed of about almost 3,000 miles an hour. Yeah, well, you might get a fine from the harbor master for that kind of tomfoolery of shutting off people's power by mistake. But uh, there could be any number of reasons why that happened, right? These things are very strange, and it's really bizarre because just like UFOs don't seem to interact with air, this thing didn't seem to be worried about any water resistance. Why um, would it worry about water resistance? However, the sonar still worked. And sonar works by a pressure wave hitting the hitting the craft and bouncing off. So if a pressure wave can interact with the craft, why isn't the craft seem to be interacting with the water when it's... Because it's in a nice, slippery light bubble. But it's still a physical object. This isn't warp drive. This isn't going through space-time. The medium is light. It's everywhere. It's in the water. It's in the air. Moving. Maybe we're not understanding how they're moving at all. And we've got some work to do here. یعنی خود درد بنا له بود دل دینش ختم نه نه بعد یا دین این که حیف از این نهره ام This is not old uh, the transmedium travel of UFOs has been observed and recorded for about 140 years none of this is old I think Sean Kirkpatrick left Arrow recently and he made some kind of public statement these things are either foreign adversaries or alien 140 years ago, they're not foreign adversaries. Um, certainly not in the 40s or 1954 when Herman Oberth talked about them. He's still grumpy. Nobody's listening. He's grumpy. Look. Um, 
And, 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 and I have a strange recommendation here. We should be watching our oceans more carefully. We don't have good satellite coverage over our oceans, because we just assume there's nothing there. Um, there's something there that we should be concerned about. Um, moreover, we shouldn't just be watching our oceans. We have other oceans in our solar system, too. And maybe we should be watching them as well. So uh, that I would also recommend, even though I don't expect us yeah, they're watching anybody you. to take on such a task in the near future. So I'm going to quick tell you one interesting thing, and I'll finish here. We at UAPX, we're trying to figure out how we can lure UFOs to, in to study them. Um, or make contact, right? So how can you do this? Um, my colleague, close colleague and friend, Matthew Shadagas, was, we, we, we finally settled on the fact that UFOs have an interest in and an ability to detect nuclear weapons, some of them underground, some of them in bunkers or in storage depots. Well, that's interesting. It really is, but that's outside of the, the uh, topic of this video. It is a clever thing he came up with. But it's nuclear power. That sounds like a nuclear battery, a new kind of nuclear battery, which uh, is beyond the, our scope here. So I'm going to take a short break and come back with two other uh, YouTube clips from YouTube channels and comment on those. We're most of the way done. But let me take a break right now. Where are we? We're going to pause. See you in a few minutes. Okay, welcome back to today's rant. If you've made it this far, congratulations. You're doing better than I have. I am because it takes it out of you to just yabber for an hour and 18 minutes, uh, even if it's something you're interested in. So let's continue, shall we? We are done now with... We are done with... The Soul Foundation, and we are continuing with engineering our way around the physics and the physicists. What we're going to do is achieve these great things he's talking about. He was talking about Dr. Knuth with the megawatts and gigawatts and thousands of miles an hour and five thousands of G's and all that stuff, and. Um, as we've explained previously, this can be done with existing technology, known physics, etc. and so forth, but it has to be applied correctly. Um, you have to stop relying on your old assumptions. Take a look at another assumption, a real obvious one. There might be something there. Easy, that everybody overlooked. Uh, but enough of the sales pitch. Let's get back to the analysis. And we're going to move on to another YouTube channel called, oops, that's the other one. This one is called All Things Unexplained. And that is linked below. And I suggest you follow them and follow the Soul Foundation. And uh, what else? What else do we do? Okay, so we're lined up here. And let's see what, why I thought this was supposed to be interesting. So. Yeah, I mean, this part of the video, looks, it looks rather strange. I mean, well, it's difficult. All right, we're going to slow that back down to normal speed. My apologies for this time-wasting but this has been my whole day, wasting my time and yours. Where are we? We're going to go to 1420. And they're going to talk about these, this UFO that we've all seen. It's called the, uh, I forgot. Uh, what's it called? <laughs> Not the witch. The flying rag over a balloon. That looking thing. The thing in a rock. Own it. The jellyfish. The UFO. jellyfish. Yeah, I mean, this part of the video looks, it looks rather strange. I mean, well, it's difficult to interpret an infrared video. And so this is an infrared, apparently. And um, because you can't see structures on the object and it gets, and it's blurred. And these are all the complaints, you know, and this is when, when the three videos were released earlier, you know, from the Nimitz 2004 event, the Gimbal and the uh, GoFast videos, you know, skeptics and scientists all complained 
oh, they're all blurry. Well, of course they're blurry. It's an infrared video. It's going to be blurry. <laughs> you know? There you go. Yes, of course they're blurry. And there's always light involved, including infrared. Now, is this thing using it? I don't know. You don't have, right. you don't have this kind of detail in an infrared video. It's a, and it was surprising to hear scientists say this because it made me want to <laughs> slap <on. laughs> Have you ever seen an infrared image? I mean, do you have any experience with Yeah, have you ever seen heat? No. Have you ever seen heat mixed up with uh, visible? What would that look like? It would look blurry. It's because they're blurry. They're going to be blurry. It's They're blurry it's heat because they're heat. going to be blurry. So they're blurry. The air around the object, that's, that, ob that air is also going to radiate. It's going to blur the image. Yeah, you get blurry images. Yeah. Images. And that happens mm -hmm. with other imagery of UFOs, too. Photographs that people take in the visible range. There's often blurry. and It's blurry because it's, you know, it's using visible. It's using heat, cold, the local Wi-Fi signal. KQVFM, WDVE FM on your dial, K Rock, wherever you are. Blurry. When you, and that's a, that's a common complaint that you hear among scientists, but when you dive into the topic and you really study these images closely, you start to realize, well, there's reasons why this is blurry. There's a lot. Yes going on here there's actually a lot of physics going on here which is interesting yes um which is leading to this being blurry um a lot of these objects appear to have some kind of appear to be ionizing the air and creating some kind of plasma sheath around all right i don't like the plasma sheath stuff that confuses people i think i think that's kind of a buffer phrase but it would grate on me because it would, you know. But, yeah, there could be some ionization there, but it shouldn't be. If it's ionizing air, it's sloppy. But it might, you know, it might. But why would you do that? On the object. So that helps, that blurs the object. Um, some of them are clearly distorting the background um, in the Aguadilla case. Because if you're blurry, if you're, I mean, if you're plasma-ish, sheath, that's mass. Plasma is mass. It's just separated, uh, you know, little ions and protons and electrons floating around depending on what's in your air or water. But we don't want to be involved with mass, touching mass. It may be a necessary evil or something if you're... You didn't get your last tune up on time or your oil change and your, you know, your dashboard's lights on or whatnot. But it shouldn't be running that way. But uh, because it's inefficient, we don't want any mass. At some point, we just want light. Maybe there's a gray area, which is a plasma sheath, which, you know, I'll be happy when I never hear that again. Because it's, it frustrates me because it's so close to the ideal. But if we have to go through there, maybe we have to have to go through there. Case uh, where you had the, the several foot long sized football shaped object fly over the, um, the airfield in Aguadilla, Puerto Rico. Yes. Um, when it passes over the parking lot, you can see in the background, you can see the lines for the parking spaces get distorted as they get close to the object, not on the object. Well, it's, it's like a heat wave that you see off your car in the summertime. And if you're, <clears throat> you should look for the shadows of them too. Those are really, that'll show you how clear air, clear to your eyes, is, is, <clears throat> it, <clears throat> Cast a shadow. Explain that away. Then you'll start thinking. Then you'll start thinking like somebody that can engineer their way out of this, out and around it. And the physics is there. These physicists did give it to us. They don't know they did, 
that's another story. We're close to it. So this object is distorting the background imagery. And why is that happening? We don't know. Um, that's something I would... Because it's distorting the air. It's lensing the air. It makes the air like a, a pair of cheap Dollar Tree uh, reader glasses for old men. Okay, same effect. It's warped. I'd like to try to study at some point, but it would be nice to have multiple videos of this to, to study. Um, you could imagine if the objects, you know, in that case, the objects hot. So if the objects hot, you could be heating the air, changing the index of refraction and bending the light that way. Yes. Um, another hypothesis has been that these things might be distorting space time. You could be. Oh, here we here we go off the rails a little bit. Creating warp oh. bubbles and things. That's been one. And if that's. Yeah. Yeah. You have to throw that two cents out there. Even I will say it could be that way. It could be going all the way down to the plank length level, basically God's nose hairs and yanking on. Yank. Or it could be just floating on ambient air that, you know, people our size of one meter range can deal with. Instead of going down, all the way down to the bottom of a universe that's, again, smaller than it is large. Let that sink in with all those high, 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 highest energies probably designed to never crack unless you are Jesus coming out of the tomb, okay, and ripping that apart. Yeah, warping space-time. Uh-huh. It was fun while it lasted on TV, but, uh, man, I'm, ugh, okay going on if there's any kind of gravitational distortion you're also going to bend the light and so yes and why is there gravitational distortion because suddenly this ufo weighs uh, more than 10,000 jupiters on steroids no it's the same ufo that's as big as a jet or something whatever you said in that other video and weighs that much whatever probably less yeah Whatever you said, I agreed with that. Um, but it's distorting the gravitational field by with light that it's controlling, absorbing, emitting, wrapping it around, throwing it where it needs to be put. Okay, so that's going to affect the gravitational field for other things that happen to get in there, such as light. So yeah, it'll bend around without all the warping and ungodly forces and masses and all that, we're going to engineer our way around that. We know that physicists think you have to maybe go through that, and a lot of other people think you have to have these great um, forces and masses and things like that, and uh, you don't. You don't, and it's doable. So... So these objects do cause optical distortions. That's common. And, and it's not that people just take blurry images of UFOs. No, there's, there's actual physics here, and we can learn things from the physics. I mean, and, and that's... And that's and I yes, yes. I mean, he's going down the right path. It sounds like I'm maybe criticizing him for being where he is, but where else would he be? And, and, and again, he's an astronomer type, astronomical physicist or something. I've forgotten, I apologize, but he's a tenured professor. He doesn't need me to respect him. So, just his boss, just his dean, right? So, um, so it's not his fault that he's stuck there. That's where everybody is. Most people are, let's say. And the only way they can see their way out, or you know, is, is with this space-time warping, you know. And I say it's easier. It can be engineered right out of that using the light matter interaction. I find that rather disappointing when I hear scientists say that, because it's like as a scientist, you should know better. This each one of these effects is a clue as to what's going on, and you should be using these clues. Yes. 
to piece together um, the physics and engineering rather yes. than just, you know, making blanket statements. So, oh, they're all blurry. And that's that's ridiculous. Yeah. Blanket statements like they're blurry and uh, I know why and I'm the only one that knows why and all that sort of stuff. And that's what a lot, some, a lot of these physicists do. And uh, some of them do. All right. So that was a nice, healthy criticism. I see why I queued that one up a few days ago. All right. That video ends right there, right at that second. So we're going to move on to another one. Thank you very much, folks, from All Things Explained. Like, share, subscribe. Now, the UFO gang will recognize this, that UFO podcast. And this is a very quick dip into this, where again, Dr. Knuth is our guest. And I think, well, let's see. I have something queued up here that I liked. I listened to a few minutes ago and agreed that I did like it and didn't mess up the timestamp. So let's see what the heck it was. Well, okay, back it up to where it should be. All right. I thought it was there already. According to this, it's 1950. He's going to say something interesting right about here. Um, but I wonder, what do you find right now, given your involvement? The people. Oop, too fast again. He's got a slight accent there, like he's walked 500 miles. And, all right. He's, I had it perfect, too. Okay, no, it's... 19, right there. Got what it. you speak to him, we're going to get onto the Sol Foundation in just a moment, <clears throat> the most intriguing aspect of the UFO topic. There are, there are two things that I find really intriguing. One is, um, the, the most intriguing is their association with water. And, and, and now, according to, you know, um, the, you know, Arrow and Congress, they, the acronym UAP supposedly stands for under or unidentified aerospace underwater. Yeah, water, which reminds me, which I stopped it here before you could finish this thought. Is, yeah, it's a fluid. So is air. So is any atmosphere. And why I wanted to stop was I wanted to shout out again the guys from SCU, the guy from Australia and or New Zealand. I forgot. They travel around, I guess. Or I might be confused. Anyway, the guy that's doing the fluid analysis of this, that's what it is. Um, he's on the right track. Phenomena, right? Or undersea mm -hmm. phenomena. And, you know, with your fluids and viscosities and relative bubbles and uh, how they interact, you know, that's going to be a big piece of it. That might be, a, you know, a, a good way to somehow this, this is going to break through the mainstream because it's right. Not because I say so, because nature made it. That's what nature is. Um. But there's a thousand different ways to look at it. That's the thing. But when you bring up water like that, that's something people can touch and feel. They can't touch and feel and see the air. So it's easier to visualize a bubble in water because we see them all the time in our daily lives. And we see how that moves differently than other things in the water and how a thing how how that's a thing that's within a thing but is not part of the thing and that's how these UAPs seem to operate isn't it um, but a water bubble isn't going through space-time ripping the fabric of the plank lengths with all the power of a thousand suns, Mr. Spock. No, it's just a little harmless water bub bubble. And that's what these things are. Okay, but, you know, it's 
It's a good analogy, I suppose. But yeah, you know, at some point, some especially if they're tracking these things on submarines, okay, they're going to see it doesn't take a YouTube, you know, troll to figure out finally that that it's acting like a bubble. These guys are underwater all the time. Come on. And, you know, I understand you need for military secrets, but uh, this has to get out in the mainstream. So any help would be appreciated. And it'll make you look good later. Um, and that underwater aspect is horribly, horribly neglected. And in fact, um, today, I think, um, Admiral Gaudelet has, um, put out, or Gaudelet has put out a, um, the soul's first white paper, which has mm -hmm. to do with the undersea aspects or underwater aspects of UFOs. I think that's the most neglected aspect of these things, um, and I, and I can say that I had... Yeah, but it might be a thing that breaks it for the very reasons I just said. Plus, they're harder to ignore that down there, right? Yeah, the whole thing, it's kind of up close and personal more so. Even though the ocean's so big, you know. But, yeah. You have less options down there. Yeah. Um... Over the last year and a half, me and the UAPX team, uh, we briefed um, Senator um, Gillibrand's team twice. We've briefed the U.S. House of Representatives Armed Services Committee. We briefed Aero, and we briefed um, the Department of National Intelligence. And they all asked us one question that they had in common, and it was the main question that we were asked was, what are your capabilities for observing underwater? That's what everybody wants to know. And that is clearly the most important aspect of, of UFOs, unidentified flying objects that, that um, there is. Uh, it's the underwater aspect. It's been horribly ignored, and, um, and, but it's, it's clearly the most important aspect. And I, and I, I find know. that fascinating. I was going to just say Admiral Gallaudet's paper. I literally saw the link for it about half an hour before we recorded. All right, that concludes uh, the video portion of our program here um, because he goes on to another question. And we don't want to repeat ourselves too much because, let's face it, <laughs> it's been done before. So, uh, yeah, you know, again, <clears throat> to our topic engineering around these guys around these problems and we can't blame them for framing them the way the mainstream does no one's put put out a better you know uh, viewpoint except me well we'll leave history to decide that but what i'm saying is with is done with existing physics uh, you know, you can go all the way, you can go back to the Greeks and look at the same thing. You can look at the phases of matter, which is simple stuff. You can look at heat making things rise, which is the most obvious. Uh, that and, you know, the motive power of heat. Um, that's obvious to us because we live in this little bandwidth, in this little world. But that same... Uh, ability can be extended to the entire spectrum. If you can use the spectrum to go through the medium, which is made of nothing but spectrum, that's what you want to do. And it doesn't take it doesn't take any new physics or even that much power to do it. But uh, you have to be focused. You have, to, you have to frame the problem correctly and then see the solution before you do that. And not stay stuck. All right, yeah, this is here because we want to discuss this, these other, this other existing physics. 
And to do that, we're going to go back to this video, which I am not going to play. This is my previous video directly before this one. And it describes two papers. All right, one's by Lewis Rancourt and Philip J. Tattersall. If you want to say, well, there's no existing physics, it's just you saying, look at, uh, look at the, the uh, legacy of Ashkin. We want to be spoon-fed, Kelly. Okay, look at this video. See if it spoon-feeds it enough for you that if, you, if you're already weightless and you can control the field around you, as is demonstrated in the video by Wayne, redoing, and I think slightly maybe changing a little bit, it previously done experiments which show that this is right, okay? One of them is called Further Experiments Demonstrating the Effect of Light on Gravitation, okay? Second one's called Experimental Verification of Electromagnetic-Gravity Effect Weighing Light and Heat by Libor Newman. All right, it's, uh, it's, it's weighing light and heat. I don't know how much, you know, and if you're weighing something, then it must have mass and or mass equivalents. Now, that's the future. It's really the present, but to you, it's the future, most of you. This track of physics which is achievable, it already exists, it's indisputable. You can put a few fine points on it if you want, okay? I, I don't know if you want to waste your time fighting a reality like that, but you have to move on from 1915 and this Flip an Einstein equation that people cling to. Clinging. There are other ways around this than space-time. And this flippant equation describes how mass and uh, space-time cling together. When the problem is how to get them to come apart. Light does that. You can see it with your own eyes. Uh, I'm not going to repeat my repeat. I'm not going to repeat myself saying I'm not going to repeat myself. But for the love of Pete, you can't just magically change gravitational, universal, cosmo. Is it no? It's not cosmological. Universal. I can't. I can't. This face looking at me. It's too much. You can't just wish that a thing like that would happen. And your own, you may not consider me a peer, and I don't care. But the ones you do, they've told you this. But you keep going on and on. So like Lord Kelvin, who says you can't go anywhere, this one is saying you can't go anywhere unless it's my way, and you can't do it unless you, you know, wish cast something into existence that by definition is a constant and can't be changed. All right? So we're going to engineer our way around people like that. Okay? Those kind of physicists. We're going to use this kind of physicist and Rancourt and Tattersall. And we don't even need them. Okay? The Wright brothers did their thing without physicists approving. They still haven't as far as I'm concerned, quantified and understood what happened there. I'm not, I'm thinking of the Montgolfier brothers. Sorry about that. The Wright brothers had to do their thing and a whole field sprung up behind them. Now they did that by observing nature and mimicking it, as did the Montgolfier brothers. And I'm saying we can take what the Montgolfier brothers did optimize it. You might say, well, that's mimicking UFOs or whatever. Maybe. You've seen them. I haven't. You tell me. I know you won't, but that's all right. Um, what was I yelling about? 
But there, yeah, I mean, you can't, uh, you can't take the word of one physicist standing in the way of progress or saying nothing can be done except my way. And especially these things that are involving vast amounts of power or some other hand waving. I'm seeing hand waving, I'm hearing hand waving. And where we're getting the results on other things, like some of these things at APEC that aren't understood, they are understood. I would say read the comments, read the chat, you'll see that it's understood. And it's a light matter interaction. Until you can exclude that, you know, you might be dealing with it. But if you think it's warp drive just because light is bending a little bit, mm, ah, or you're getting a little bit of thrust after you charged up an electron and it absorbed the ambient light and you think you're in a vacuum, but you're not in a vacuum. You're in a vacuum of matter, maybe. There's no air in there, but there's still temperature. That's what you're interacting with, which is a good thing because that's the way space is. So you want, you know, you want that. But until then, where are we? I think I'm done. Oh, oh boy, yeah. <clears throat> I'm going to stop for a minute and tee this one up because this is might be funny. Hold on. Okay. We're back. We're back to the movie review section of this, uh, this video. We're going to play a clip from a movie that we love and we expect, well, I, who's we? I don't know. Why am I saying that? Everyone should watch it and pay money for it. It's called Crimes and Misdemeanors by uh, Woody Allen. It reminds me of this almost useless equation here for our purposes, okay? It's not telling us how to free mass from gravity. Now, maybe if you twisted it around some, someone would take that initiative to show that light will free mass from gravity, which it indisputably, inarguably does. Can be shown in so many different ways, it's never been shown in the best way. All we hear about this stupid, it's not stupid, but it's used stupidly, repeatedly, in this field of anti-gravity and UFO propulsion over and over and over and over again. We hear this. Matter tells space-time how to curve, and curved space-time tells matter how to move. And then they go on for hours with these equations. They're not mindless, but it's, it's super, superfluous for hours. And it doesn't solve the problem or even attempt to. All it does is tell you how it's stuck. It tells you what the problem is over and over, but harder and harder with more and more force, you know, the exact opposite of what you what you need if you're going to try to figure this stuff out. Or even if there is no stuff to improve the station of the shaved ape. Again, let's hear it. And then it's going to remind me of this movie, which everyone should run out and see. I gave it five stars. Matter tells space-time how to curve. And curved space-time tells matter how to move. Ad infinitum. Like this guy. ...about comedy is, if, it's, if it bends, it's funny. If it breaks, it's not funny. So you gotta get back from the pain, see what I mean? Oh, if I hear it again. If it bends, it's curved space-time. It's not fun, you know. Move on. All right, I think that's just about it. Oh, no, no, no. We have a little postscript here. Well, first we tell that guy who blocked us, me. Uh, well, I'll just put a little note on there. For the record, again, you can't change a fundamental universal constant just by pretending you can. All right? You heard that before. Okay, everyone has. So why beat that to death? 
when there's stuff right out there, right in front of your face, that'll free mass from gravity. Now, that brings us winding down. Uh, lighter than air stuff here. Okay, maybe that'll be the next one. I try to think of a way to squeeze that in here. But the spy balloons will do it for you, and everybody on the planet will be looking at this guy's Korea UFO, Joshua Bertrand, at his uh, Twitter page for figuring it out ahead of everybody, which I can kind of relate to. Now, oh yeah, okay, since we are trying to talk about, get back to the point of this thing, Going on two hours, oh boy. Engineering around the physics and the physicists. There's a gap, isn't there? Yeah, there is. Some of it's helpful. Where do we interact? How do we, how do we... Engineers learn to interact more efficiently with physics and the new stuff that comes out and how it can be used. You know, um, and that's where we come down to this guy. You UFO types know exactly who this is. And I was going to use him as an example of a physicist who knows a little bit about engineering. But actually, he's an engineer with a, a rare degree. Uh, you can look that up yourself. It's like applied physics. Only it's engineers that understand physics. In other words, there's an edge there. And these camps don't speak. But there are small disciplines, which I'm saying should be greatly expanded. And this guy's basically in it. And you wonder how a guy grows up to be the guy who was actually in a space, a, a captured, crashed UFO. He says he does. And he's pretty serious about it. I, you know, I, I don't think he said it under oath, but, you know, they cleared him to say it. You know, that's a gray legal area that I'm not going to get into unless somebody's paying me billable hours and I'm retired. That's who gets to get in there. All right. Now, he might get in there and not know what he's looking at, which is understandable at first. Because it's going to look like, you know, it's not going to look like, it's not going to say right on it in English words or any decipherable language. It'll say on, off, up, down, whatever, in a foreign language or something. But, uh, I don't know. If you're listening, I'm telling you what it is. I'm telling you what it might be. But you probably know that by now. The issue is, how do we move forward? Getting this into the private sector. That's not your job. Unfortunately, that's my job right now. Because it, uh, you know, if you do, unless you like this economy, which some people do, apparently. A lot of people concerned about climate change. I'm not. I don't think there's any problem with it. I think it's stupid. The sun controls it. But if you're actually really worried about that, then you better look into this stuff. And you better broaden your horizons. All right. Well, that's enough. Don't you just love when you have to wake up in the morning when you, the main thing you're going to do is tell other people what they should do? When it took you 45 minutes to f turn on the flipping camera? Well, I spent money on this new camera, so I wanted to use it. I wasn't going to go ahead. But I think we're done. I think we're almost outro time. Yeah, I don't know what else to say. Look at the script. Not much on it. Look at the thumbnail one last time. We did it. And I think that's about it. I think we're going to pause and do an outro, finally. Thank you for tolerating this rant. I'll wave goodbye now.
till next time. Oh, wrong one. Desk only. Pause. <laughs>